That's so effective. I love that. I mean, that's, I think that's something really haunting about and, and exciting about the score is that like there, there is this physicality of the viscerality of the human body is in the score, which is so, um, uh, which is wild, you know, which is kind of the emergence of wildness, you know? And so you, <laughs> it feels like it really supports these women kind of like, you know, like <laughs> cracking themselves open. Sometimes I'm not so experimental. I'm like, you know, give me a framework and I'll figure out my space in there. And with you, you were very open to the process of exploration, mm -hmm. you know, and just seeing how it goes, giving the artists you collaborate with agency to bring their ideas to the table and just figure it out. And um, I remember saying to you, I was like, oh, you know, that's really great. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I always want to be like, okay, let's just have a plan. We can go off the rails, but can we, can we just figure it out? You know? And I don't know if that's a function of living in a society where I, I have something to push against, mm. but I remember like, that was, that's a big part of your process. And I was really inspired by that. And so I was able to trust it, you know? I'm curious, like how, because you, I remember when you started jamming out uh, music, I was like, I don't know how she's getting this much creative inspiration this quickly because like, I think one of the first pieces you wrote was this emissary captive queen piece that was like stunning. hated socializing at school, but she forced herself to do it. Hi, Caroline. Back again, Mrs. Nemser. <laughs> My, you are a voracious reader. You know, you and Fred should come to the house. The dean and I would love to have you. Plus, it must be rather dull for young folks like you to spend all your time with... with that woman, I mean. I hear she never leaves the house. Or her bed, for that matter. She's gone sick in the head. Uh, no, she's she's working quite hard. Every hour, every day. I only get my information from Stanley. She was relieved to spot someone lurking near the punch bowl, looking as miserable as she felt. But his was a face that she'd never seen before on campus. And men were always easily spotted. Hyman House, huh? Yes, sir. I can't get my carriers to deliver up there anymore. She writes stories with cannibalism in them. That's what I've heard. Mr. Fisher, do you, um, do you often give young girls rides in your postal truck? I'm not sure I like your question. Oh, I just mean, is it a habit of yours to shuttle college girls along your route? Paula was proud of the way she contradicted him, how she stayed ahead of the conversation. This is what it's like to be a grown woman talking to a man. I never seen Paula before that day in my life. Giving her a ride was a Samaritan thing to do. Girl was half frozen, nothing but thin sneakers on. Said she was going for a hike. I wasn't going to get any further into her business. But I didn't like that, seeing it was almost sundown. She had no knapsack. She had no provisions. I assumed she must have been meeting someone. When they were at the party, he had barely looked at her. His voice had a lightness. Let's go somewhere quieter, he said. A hand on her back. 
But now, but now, away from everyone, his voice was muted, floating above her. And she couldn't, she couldn't contradict him. For a cue like that, where there's lots of voiceover and there's conversation, um, I love when I get to write through stuff like that. Um, because I don't come from a traditional film score writing background. So when, how, how do I say this? So I know that when you're taking it at conservatory or you're taking it at university, there are these rules mm. and apparently I, I break a lot of them. But what it is for me is that I'm just thinking in terms of live music, polyphonic um, environments, you know, polytonal environments. How does everybody play together nicely? Mm. And you can have a lead instrument in a scene where people are talking. You just have to know how to place it. And it's not so much about the mix, but where you're placing the movement of the instrument, it's, it's a dance, mm. you know? And so you have to like carve space around the dialogue and mm. you can do it in a way that's tasteful, I, I believe, you know? I, I don't think there's really a cardinal sin where that is concerned, depending on what the work is. Right, right. Yeah, and I think it makes it, I think it's it's really important. And especially in a movie like this, where the film is sort of haunted by this other presence, that there is this character that Shirley and Rose are researching together that is in a way you really uniting them. It's, there's a, there is another presence in the movie that, you, that we are, are, we're trying in so many ways to bring out. And I think the score is a way that that kind of that that presence was really making itself known and it's almost needs, it almost requires like to have its own voice. Yeah, and I gave her one. It wasn't like we treated her like a footnote or just, um, you know, a vehicle for yeah. the story. It's like, and that's why I say three voices because it's Shirley, Rose and the missing girl, Paula. Like Paula is certainly a character in the film. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess that's, you know, like how she's carved out so humanely, um, I, I, I don't know, I, I just wonder about that, how people usually present someone who isn't going to physically be there, but is a thought, a memory, or someone that doesn't have physical, isn't taking up physical space. Mm -hmm. I felt like we honored the, her her fully, you know? Yeah, yeah, very much so. I, I agree. I think that was one of the big discoveries in editing, honestly, because, well, she obviously we shot a bit of her during the shoot, um, when we got into editing, we were like, oh, we really need to bring out Paula so that we were able to follow the, this character. And we, we actually ended up adding a lot of the voiceover narration sections in the edit. And Sarah, our writer, wrote these incredible, like, faux Shirley <laughs> um, uh, kind of, like, snippets from Shirley's, like, writing that then that became kind of her first drafts of, of this novel. Um, and that I think really br brought in, you know, okay, you know, when is Shirley um, really connecting to Rose? When is Rose inspiring something, uh, something about this character? When is Shirley reacting against Rose in this work? It's really daring and risky because technically she's embodied by Odessa, that same actress yeah. that's playing um, Rose. So, you know, it's like definitely, I think, but what's so interesting is that there was never, I always knew when it was Rose or when it was Paula. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, because of that, that the, the, the breadcrumb piece, you know, just the, the introduction of Paula's voice, you know, the fact that there are three singular voices that come together mm -hmm. to create the chord that is the story. Gosh, it's so fun to get to like, remember this time working and, on this and, with you. I was just, uh, what a pleasure. For me, it's, a, it's gonna stick out. This work I did with you is definitely going to stick out in the long run. I, I feel that it will have a lasting presence. And thank you for making awesome art. Thank you.